This is part one of a series called Discovering Christianity. The speaker is the Reverend Dennis Shelton of Sydney. Sometimes I've been in a car park and it's been quite interesting because you see I work there occasionally and uh, people park where they shouldn't park and so you go up to people and you say now excuse me you shouldn't be parking there and they look at you and they want to see who you are by what right do you have to come and to tell them where to park, you see. And of course, I suppose you and I, we've been in that sort of situation many times when somebody comes along and tells us that we have to do something, we should park here, we should go there, we should keep to the speed, and we say, well, who are you to talk to me? Who are you to tell me what to do? And you know, I think you'd agree with me that in the, the times in which we live, there is a tremendous crisis of authority, and we say, well, who do you believe? How do we know what anybody is saying is right? Well, my name's Dennis Shelton, and I want to try and communicate with you just about these very things, because, you know, there is a crisis of authority. We don't know what to believe. We do not know where we're going, and there's nobody even having the courage to say to us, look, this is the way. This is the way to go. And so we want to share this with you because we do believe that by the grace of God, we know something of the way. But we've got to start with that question of authority because you might say to me, well, who do you think you are to lecture me about religion? Who are you? Good question. Well, I'm not going to tell you about myself. That's another story. But I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the Christian faith, which means so much to me. So that's what we're going to do, and today, in our first time, we're going to look at this question of authority. How is it that we can really know what is right and what is wrong? So, there's our first question. By what authority do we say these things? Now, there are many answers to this question, and I'm going to take a few of them. And perhaps some of them you have thought of, and some of them you may even believe. Because if I came to you and said, do you believe in God? And you might say, yes. Of course, you might say, no. But you may say, yes. And I say, all right, then you believe in God. Now, how do you know? What's the basis on which you build? Now, you know, there are four possibilities for a basis of believing, for believing what somebody is telling us. The first common one is what we would call human reason, which is so very well known. People believe because they feel it and think it inside themselves. And people today are encouraged to express themselves. Children at school, you know what it's like at school. The children come home and you are amazed at what they're saying. You're amazed that they express their opinion so openly and so readily. And you're saying, well, why are they doing it? Well, because this is the educational environment, you see. They're encouraged to say what they believe. And they believe it just because they feel it. Now, technically, we can say this is human reason. This is a source of authority and people that follow the rationalist society for instance they say well things have to be in accordance with human reason and i suppose that you know when we think about that uh, there's something to be said for that sometimes As some people have said about the christian faith they said well you know if if the christian faith said that black is white i would believe it well do we have to go that far because I personally do believe that belief in God and in the Christian faith is truly reasonable. But if we say the basis is human reason, what human reason are you going to pick? We've got in this world 6,000 million people or whatever, and we've got 6,000 million sets of human reason here. And now which one are you going to follow? You say, well, the one I've got. But how do you know it's right? How do you know? You don't really know, do you? So when we talk about human reason, yes, it's a wonderful faculty that God has given us. There's no doubt about us to be able to think and to be able to reason and so on. But it can't give us absolute answers because we're all different, you see. And then you might say, well, if that is the case, what else is there? Now, I've met some people, for instance, that said, I've had a vision. 
God has spoken to me. I've had a vision of Christ. I remember a man, this is many years ago, and he said, I've just had this wonderful vision of Christ. And I said, oh, what have you? And he described he was 12 foot tall and he had such and such a clothes on it. And it was just a typical Renaissance picture of Jesus. And I don't really believe that Jesus looked like a Renaissance Jesus at all. But this vision captivated him. And this vision of what it said to him was going to be that on which he based his life. Now, the only problem, of course, we have with visions, or we've got a few problems with them, but one of them is that his vision is different from somebody else's vision, because I've heard many descriptions of what Jesus is like. And so you say, well, uh, excuse me, which one do you actually believe? Which vision are you going to follow? And you know, that's a problem. That is a terrible problem. It's like human reason. It depends upon the person. Well, in that case, there are some other people that have a very good source of authority that they go to consistently. They say, look, I believe in God because the church tells me. I've been in the church all my life. I was baptized or christened as a baby, and my parents took me along. I went to Mass, or I went to Holy Communion, I went to this. And I believe because the church has told me all about God, and I believe because that is what the church says. Well, of course, we're in favor of churches. It's a good thing to worship God, we know that. But you see, when we talk about the church's authority, then I, I'm afraid we have to ask the same question, which church? Are we talking about the Roman Catholics? Are we talking about the Protestants? Are we talking about the Greek Orthodox? Are we talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Are we talking about the Mormons? Are we talking about the Brethren? Who are we talking about here? Because they all teach in varying degrees different truth or doctrine. And so the church is appealing, but again, which church? Now, there are some churches that stress this very, very strongly. They say, God has guided the church. God gave the church the Bible. God brought the Bible into being through the church. And God has led the church through all the councils down through the ages, not just the Bible. But, you know, after the apostolic age, the times of the apostles, the church met in solemn councils and decided things. And we've got all of that today. So I don't have to think. I don't really even have to do much digging because the church tells me. And I am happy and I am comfortable with that. Well, you see... That I can understand, but I have a problem with it. And you see, the problem I have with it is not only the diversity of churches, but do you know what? Churches can make mistakes. Do you realize that? Has your church ever made a mistake? Now, of course, you might you know, think very hard about that and think, oh, yes, well, the priest or the minister we had a little time back, he wasn't very good. Uh, I knew of one, for instance, that when I was driving down the road, if he was coming in the other direction, I had to be very careful because he was more often under the influence of alcohol than not, you see. And so we in the country town had to give him a bit of a wide berth. And so you have all sorts of different ministers and priests and churches. And, you know, some Sometimes you even say to them, as I've said to some, well, your church teaches, for example, that the world was created in six days. And they say, oh, no, it doesn't really. I mean, yes, it does. But we don't really believe it, you know. Well, the church teaches it officially, but you will meet that. You will meet that consistently, where even those that are in the church and are pastors in the church don't really practice and teach what the church wants them to teach or is supposed to teach. So it really is a shifting foundation on which we're building here. So what do we believe? Human reason? Do we believe the visions or the revelation that somebody's had? For instance, the Mormon religion is built, it's a huge religion, and it is built upon a vision. A vision that Joseph Smith had in around the 1830s of, of an angel. And that's where they get their Mormon scriptures and that from. You know, the church is built upon it. Well, which church do we believe? You know what the only answer to this is? Now, you may disagree with me here. 
And this is the problem we've got right at the beginning of this series, you see. The problem we have at the beginning is trying to find between you and me some common ground on which we can build. If we don't find it, then that's going to make our task much more difficult. But we're going to try it. You see, because I'm going to tell you, or I'm going to say to you, look, as far as a foundation, as far as authority is concerned, the only authority I know that doesn't change is this book which I call the Bible, which has 66 books in it, and which was written over a period of about 1,500 years, you see. And you might say, well, we were expecting you to say that, you see. Well, just hear me out. Just hear me out, you see, because the Bible is at least something that doesn't change. Now, you might say, oh, yes, it does, doesn't it? Because you might say, it's not the Bible, it's the problem, it's the way you interpret it. It's just your interpretation. Well, I want you to hear me out on that too, you see. Because I'm just assuming that you and I, we know English, and we can open up our Bibles and we can read in one or another translation. There, We won't get into translations, there are some that are better than others, but we're not getting into that at the moment. We're just assuming that you and I speak a common language and we call it English. And we open up this book, and we want to see what it has to say. And do you know what? The wonderful thing about this book is, if you open it today, and then you open it in two weeks' time, it'll say the same thing. And the people that read it 300 years ago are still saying the same thing, you see. See, visions change. Human reason changes with different people. Churches can change their positions and what they believe. But you know, this book, it does not change, and it has not changed. Now, yes, you're quite right that sometimes human interpretations do change. And that shows we've got to work hard to understand what this book is saying. But you know, it's wonderful. I've been a Christian now by God's grace for about all oh, 40 years. And what a blessing to have known the Lord for that time. And I've been reading my Bible all those years. And you know, I've also been reading what other people say about the Bible. You know, it's interesting. I can go back 300 years, and I can see people looking at the Bible and seeing the same things. I go back 400 years, 500 years, 1,000 years to the writings that have been preserved to some people. And you know, they know the same God that I know. They are reading the same, or maybe in a different language, but the same things they are reading and understanding, I am. And it's all coming from this one book. And you know, that is the amazing and wonderful thing about the Bible. If we go back, for instance, 500 years, there was a time which I might refer to sometimes in these lectures, which we call the Reformation. And it was a time of tremendous upheaval, and we can't give you the history of the Reformation, of course, that's for another time. But, you know, some of those people that taught then, they had a wonderful respect for the Bible. And uh, there was one of them, for instance, like Luther, who said, In the word of God you should hear nothing but God speaking to you. And that gives us a little clue about the Bible. You know what the Bible is? It's not like a vision. It's not like what the church says. It's as though God has sent you a letter. As though God has written down something and he wants you to read it. And that is the best way for us to know what God is thinking. It's written, we can read it and go back through. I mean, today we have tapes like you're listening to this on a tape and so on. We can play those back and so on. Well, they, of course, didn't exist in the time that the Bible was written. It was written down. And so this is the means that God chose so that you get the same message as Luther got 500 years ago, as Chrysostom got over a thousand years ago, and as the apostles had, because they had a Bible which was the Old Testament. We'll talk about that in a moment. But we see, that's what he said, you can hear nothing but God speaking to you. And Calvin said the same thing. He said, we owe to the scripture the same reverence which we owe to God because it has come from him alone and it doesn't have 
human things in it. Now, what he meant by that was that it, not that it didn't have human things in it. Of course the Bible does. It talks about wars. It talks about loving. It talks about hating. It talks about eating. It talks about sleeping. It talks about history and biology and so on. But in this human framework, God speaks to us as though he were in the room talking to you and me now. Isn't it wonderful when we think that is what... You might say, oh, I don't agree. I do not agree because people have, have made so many mistakes in interpreting the Bible and the different translations and so on. I'll say, well, look, I would like you just to bear with me. We're trying to find some common ground. And this is common ground which has been common to Christians from many churches, many ages, many cultures many languages, the one common ground we have is this book. That is what makes the Christian religion distinctive. So therefore, when we're talking about what do we believe, by what authority am I talking to you on this tape about uh, the Christian religion, my friends, this is my authority, this book. That is it. Not a vision I've had, not the church I belong to, uh, and certainly not my own human reason, though certainly my human reason is still there, as yours is, and so on. But this is the authority upon which I base what I'm telling you today. And so then, when we think of this authority, the next question that we do have to ask, if we're going to consider the Bible, is, well, who gave it its authority? Who gave it its authority? And the answer is that it came from God. God himself revealed these things. Now, I don't know how much you know of the revelation of God to his people. When we go back to the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, for instance, and Moses led them into the desert of Sinai to the mountain, and God wanted to give them his law so that they could live properly as a new nation. And God decided to give it to them that it would be written down. And that is where God appeared to Moses. And he appeared to him for 40 days. And he went through it all and Moses wrote it down. Now that was not the first time that God had dealt with people. You see, God dealt with Noah. God dealt with Abraham. Lots of people in the Old Testament he spoke to in that way. You see, why do we need that revelation? I'll tell you why. You see, because God is very different from you and me. And we're going to talk about that in our next time when we're going to ask, well, which God's God? Because lots of people talk about God and say, I believe in God. But we're going to look at that next time. But you see, God is very different from us. If you, if you think of it for a moment, if I were to say to you, what would life be like as an ant? Suppose you were an ant, and you look, you can see them scurrying around there on the ant's nest. And uh, perhaps, you, I don't know whether you've had any trouble with white ants, like one of our neighbours in one of their houses, they had uh, in their house next door. And the white ants were very clever and got in through there into the timbers and so on. Very clever. And you say, well, that's, that's really, really smart, that is. He wasn't very happy about it, of course. Cost him a lot of money, too. But... Uh, What's life like as an ant? And when you look at it, you know, the only way that you can really understand it is that if you were actually an ant yourself, but if you did have some human intelligence, that would be the only way to be actually living like them. Now, God is different from us, and we will see that, as I've mentioned later. So different from us. But he communicated what he wants us to know in words that we can understand. And so he spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Noah at the time when the world was terribly evil. He spoke to Moses and he gave them these laws. And so therefore God revealed himself in words. And that is why the Bible is so very important. But you know, there's another reason too why the Bible was given in this way. And Jesus himself shows us that. You might say, well... You, it's all very well for you to say that God revealed this. How do we know? 
Well, my best answer to that is because Jesus said so. Now, of course, later we will talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and why he came and so on. But you see, it's called the Christian religion that we're talking about. And that word Christian comes from a person called Christ, which is an English word which comes from a Greek word, which is Christos, which is the equivalent of a Hebrew word, Messiah or Messiah. He is the anointed one. And so I'm talking to you about the Christian religion. I'm not talking about Buddhism. I'm not talking about Hinduism. I'm not talking about Islam. We're talking about the Christian religion. And so Jesus is very important. And so therefore for us to say, well, the Bible is our source of authority, I would have to say to you, I believe that because Jesus did. And Jesus did. He quotes the Bible. If you look at the Gospels, and you may not have read them yet, but if you look at the Gospels, you will see that Jesus speaks about the Bible over and over again. In one of the key tests in his early life, the devil, and of course we'll talk about the devil. You might not believe in the devil, but, well, there's enough trouble in the world for me to believe there's a devil apart from the Bible saying about it. But you see, the devil led him into the desert to test him. And three times the devil tried to test Jesus. And three times Jesus said, it is written. What? Didn't he say, well, I am the son of God and I'm now going to tell you what's right, devil? No, he didn't. He didn't do that at all. He actually went to a book. And that was his Bible, the Old Testament. And we'll talk about the Old and New Testament, what they are in a moment. But he actually went that, not once, not twice, but three times. And he went back and he said, devil, this is what is written in God's word. So you see, that is why I go back to the Bible, because Jesus did. That is why I accept the Bible, because he said, he said, the scripture can't be broken. He went over and over again, whether in the Sermon on the Mount, when he was talking about questions like divorce, when he was talking about killing, when he was talking about stealing, when he was talking about whether you lend somebody something. All these things he went back to the, the, to the Bible. And so when we're talking about the Christian religion, my friends, we've got to go back to the common ground. The common ground we see right down through the ages, and that's this book, the Bible. Now you might say, well, I don't believe that. Well, that's okay. You don't believe that. But I do have to ask you, by what authority do you believe what you believe? Come on. What basis do you really have? Your human reason changes. Do you know what? Your reason can be taken away. You can lose it. What a terrible thought. You visit people sometimes in uh, elderly uh, people's homes and they have Alzheimer's disease or dementia and it appears they're bereft of reason. Oh, it's a fickle thing, reason. It really is. And so are the churches. Your church changes. My church changes. It makes mistakes. Your church makes mistakes. And as for the visions, they're everywhere. People have heard voices and things that go bump in the night. And they're using these to guide their lives. People can have visions with drugs. Oh, they can have... And I haven't mentioned the other religions and philosophies and so on that people follow. When We might mention those from time to time. But wherever else we look, there is uncertainty. There is change. We come back to this book and it is the same. And my friends, it's a wonderful book. A wonderful book. Our time is going, but you know, it is a wonderful book. It has 66 books in it. What we call the Old Testament, which belonged to the people of Israel, goes from Genesis to Malachi. There are 39 books in that, starting from historical books back in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Oh, they're difficult to get your tongue around sometimes, the names of these books, aren't they? Let alone remembering what they're about. But those first five books are sometimes called law and history. Then the next group, there's a large group of history telling what God did with the children of Israel right from the period of Joshua and Judges through to the kings, wonderful King David, right in the center of history. If you ever want dates to remember, it by David was about 1000 BC. That's easy to remember. And so 
after David and Solomon, the kingdom broke up and they all the north and south kingdom became wicked and the north went into slavery and the south went into slavery 150 years after it. And these terrible things happened, but we learn so many lessons with God dealing with them so that you and I don't have to repeat the mistakes that people made hundreds or thousands of years ago. That's why we've got this book, you see. It's not just to try and fill your head with a little bit of theology, but it is to give us also guidance for how to live today. And that's what people want. That's what you want. That's what I want. How am I going to live my life today? On what am I going to build my life? What am I going to believe? How do I know what's right? How do I know what's wrong? Did you know there's only one consistent answer that gives the same answers today as it did 100 years ago and 500 years ago and 1,000 years ago? It is this amazing and wonderful book which we call the Bible because it goes right through from those 39 books in the Old Testament to the 27 books telling us about Jesus and the early church and Paul writing to them and even giving us a glimpse of the future. And if you persevere with this series, the last one will be on what's ahead. And that'll be interesting. So you want to stay with it. I encourage you to stay with it. But my dear friends, we have to find some common ground. And I'm going to start with saying and recommending to you, consider the Bible just for the time being. That is our common ground. If you don't have one, I'm sure wherever you got this tape, uh, these tapes from, somebody will give you one. And we'll refer to it from time to time and talk about its message. But let's start with that common ground. And so therefore, if we go back to the car park and we haven't parked properly, and you look at this person and say, by what authority? The person just turns around and shows you their badge, you see, and says, Chatswood Chase Car Park. There it is. Or... They've pulled up on the road, and you say, by what authority do you do this thing? And he opens, and there's his badge, and there's his photo, and there's the authentication there. And so therefore you have every right to say to me, by what authority do you do these things? And I produce this book, and I say, by this authority, because it says of itself, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And this lamp and this light we're going to use as we go through the rest of our series.